Welcome to our webinar on open access monographs, current initiatives, and progress on sustainable models. My name is Terry Fischel. I'm library director at McAllister College, and I'm a member of the Lever Press Oversight Committee. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping details. This webinar is being recorded. We will make a copy available as soon as possible with a version that has captioning available within a few weeks. For Twitter, we're using the hashtags that I posted in the webinar chat. It's hashtag OA monographs along with OA week. Um, in terms of the questions that you have for the panelists, please do use the chat box. Mike Roy, who is the Dean of the Library at Middlebury College, will be joining me in moderating the questions and sending them, monitoring the questions and sending them to our moderator. Our moderator today is Kevin Smith, Dean of Libraries at the University of Kansas. Prior to joining the University of Kansas, Kevin served as the Director of Copyright and Scholar Communications at the Duke University Libraries. And I will be turning this over to Kevin. Kevin will be introducing our four panelists. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Terry. I'm pleased to be here and welcome to all the participants. I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion, excuse me, interesting discussion this afternoon. As Terry said, I'm going to introduce each of our four panelists and they are each going to give fairly short introductions to their particular projects. Um, and then we will have time for questions. We have a few questions that were sent in in advance but by all means, enter your questions in the chat and Terry and Roy will pass them on to me and I will uh, pose them to our panelists. So if the panelists are all ready, I think we'll get started. And I'm just looking and they're nodding. So um, our first panelist, and I'm gonna introduce each panelist just before they speak. So our first speaker this afternoon is Wendy pratt Logie, who is the University Librarian, Dean of Libraries, and McKnight Presidential Professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She obviously has a large business card and it's a very impressive title. Prior to her appointment at the University of Minnesota in 2002, Wendy held several positions at the University of Michigan over a 20 year period, including Director of the Harlan Hatcher Graduate Library and Associate Director of the University Library for Digital Library Services. Her work in launching and developing a premier digital library program at Michigan was recognized with the American Library Association Hugh Atkinson Award in 2003, the Computer World Honors Program Laureate in 2002, and Michigan's Walter H. Kaiser Award in 2001. Wendy will be speaking on the AAUP Open Access Monograph Publishing Initiative, a new initiative with 13 universities and 60 university presses participating. Universities provide subventions for open digital monographs to be published by university presses. So Wendy, if you're all set, let's go. Okay. Just one second here. Um, trying to get it to uh, share the screen here. There we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm first up and I'm, I'm going to be talking about a project that is in its uh, early stages, very formative stages, and it has a purpose to introduce change in monograph publishing in the humanistic disciplines. Um, I, so I'll speak mostly to its lineage and its goals, but uh, along the way, hopefully get some of the characteristics that we're putting in place. So in brief, you can see here the sponsors, uh, three organizations that have come together uh, under this initiative. Uh, there are 12 participating institutions that you see listed here. And as was uh, noted by Kevin, the, the primary focus is a subvention model for long, long form monographic works in humanities and in human humanistic social sciences published by university presses. I think it's important to note that it was born out of a number of research and pilot efforts funded by the Mellon Foundation dealing with publication in the humanities, as well as the future of university presses. And I'd encourage you, there's a, a quite a good overview of those projects in the Journal of Electronic Publishing, published in 2017, um, entitled Reassembling Scholarly Communications. 
So here's some context, and I framed things in terms of three quotes that I think capture the three forces at play behind the initiative. The first quote by AAUP's uh, executive director, Peter Berkeley, speaks to the fragility and the volatility in university presses at the moment. Declining library sales, limited markets, and a challenge of capital investments to keep up with new technologies. So indeed, a, a sort of existential pressure, as he says. The second quote, I think, gets at what I would call the innovation crisis. And it's a shared problem between authors and presses in that we have a monograph genre that is, is deeply stubborn, as it suggests here. Uh, the author cultures often want to keep it as such, but also presses in, in stepping up to the technologies necessary for innovation. And the third quote is from that overview of Mellon initiatives and speaks to this particular initiatives uh, model, the subvention model, but begs the question about whether the academic culture will accept the model. Will it accept openness? Will it accept a digital form of scholarship? Or will it be viewed as an inferior uh, second tier form of publication? So the framing criteria that the 12 institutions have uh, worked out is that first of all, these will be competitive awards to uh, individual authors. Um, and we assume that they will be based on the author having had an accepted peer reviewed manuscript by a university press. They will be openly published digitally uh, with an open access um, uh, form of license, um, uh, Creative Commons and funded by the subvention with a minimum baseline that we have identified of $15,000 per work and each institution is committing to three publications per year. We're agnostic on the digital platform based on what the uh, press can provide and we also assume that in some cases there will want to be a print counterfeit afforded. Now the issues that have arisen in this short lifespan of this initiative are several. As each institution works to uh, implement, they've raised some questions about what they want to do locally in terms of focus. For example, should the focus be on assistant professors or tenured faculty? Are we trying to incentivize innovation or is the, is the primary motive to just simply get a book-like object put into digital form? There's also concern about metrics, not only to evaluate the initiative, but also to evaluate the impact over time of, of these new genre. And we are working to establish the technologies to capture metrics from across the distributed platforms. Issues have also risen about the contract, and in particular questions around the degree of openness that are acceptable uh, to the faculty authors. One immediate question has been whether the willingness is there to have derivatives as a part of the uh, Creative Commons license. And then lastly, there are questions about how we market and how we engage broader communities in this initiative. So we are working with disciplines largely through their societies and associations on, on those um, endeavors. So where does that take us in terms of the future of the book? Well, obviously it's premature for us to forecast since this was just launched last spring. The first step we acknowledge is sort of a print comparable digital monograph, but the core question is how will it evolve and what is the pace of change? What are the enabling and disruptive forces and how will the genre evolve within each discipline? There are issues also around infrastructure in the print world, we know there are mechanisms in place for discovery, for delivering the book, and for preserving it. But what will happen in a digital context, and what is the role of the library? There are questions around the digital platform and how it evolves over time, whether or not it can scale with new functions uh, and can be generalized uh, to new opportunities. And lastly, Perhaps the, the fundamental question is the challenge of adoption. How will this new model that is digital, open, and subvened, how will it be adopted within the academy and within individual disciplines? And that remains the $64,000 question. Thank you.
Thank you, Wendy. You just posed a lot of really challenging questions for us that we could probably spend the rest of the uh, webinar talking about. But before we talk about some of them, and I hope we do, uh, our next speaker is Charles Watkinson. Charles is the Associate University Librarian for Publishing at the University of Michigan Library and Director of the University of Michigan Press. Prior to moving to Michigan in 2014, Charles was Director of Purdue University Press and Head of Scholarly Publishing Services in the Purdue Libraries for five years. He's also been the Director of Publications at the American School of Classical studies in Athens, which sounds like a great job. Charles has served on the board of directors of the Association of American University Presses and the Society for Scholarly Publishing, and on the executive group of the Library Publishing Coalition Project. Charles will be speaking about Lever Press, a partnership between the University of Michigan Press and Amherst Press, and also about Knowledge Unlatched. He is a board member of Knowledge Unlatched and will provide some comparison information between these two initiatives. So Charles, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you can see my screen um, with the title slide. Um, so uh, just to explain where I'm coming from. Um, uh, so I'm actually a board member of Knowledge Unlatched Research, and I'll explain how that differs from Knowledge Unlatched in a moment. And as um, head of Michigan Publishing, I'm party to the Lever Press initiative. I, I'm involved in the Lever Press initiative in a way that I'll also explain. So that's where I'm coming from, but I'm sort of evaluating the two initiatives from a, trying to do it from a, a place of some remove, um, because they're both interesting initiatives that share uh, the feature of being organized um, and funded by groups of libraries, but have some distinctive differences between them too. So um, I sort of encapsulated uh, the difference, the main difference between Knowledge Unlatched and Lever Press in terms of the roles that libraries play within those two initiatives. Within Knowledge Unlatched, libraries are building on their expertise as selectors of content. Within Lever Press, uh, it's this new and emerging role as publishers of content that really comes to the fore. Knowledge Unlatched, as you probably mostly know, is, uh, was founded in 2012. In 2016, something significant happened, which is uh, Knowledge Unlatched split in two, and um, the operations side of the initiative uh, was taken over by Sven Fund uh, and is now run as Knowledge Unlatched GmbH from Germany. And the, um, uh, the, the research part separated off um, it is what is known as a CIC, which is um, a kind of a social enterprise classification in the UK. Um, so that, uh, that division happened in 2016. And uh, publishers and libraries working together to make previously published works open access, um, an emphasis on traditional containers of books and increasingly journals, so not a strong mandate around innovative format. format and uh, uh, increasing sort of diversification in uh, recent months, including an announcement uh, that Knowledge Unlashed will become um, a service provider for other publishers, helping to create um, transactional mechanisms for publishing uh, new open access work, taking care of the transactional bit, in other words. Um, so definite change within the organization uh, since Sven Fund uh, has taken it over. And success in uh, unlatching, making freely available um, almost uh, 500 titles. Lever Press uh, was created in 2016 um, after um, several years of research and thinking by the creators. And the uh, creating group was a group of Oberlin, uh, Oberlin groups, uh, select liberal arts college uh, librarians, but the group behind Lever Press has now expanded to include non Oberlin group libraries. And uh, this group of librarians chose a partnership of Amherst College Press that's taking the editorial lead and Michigan Publishing that's taking the production lead to partner with to actually create Lever Press. And a very strong focus of Lever Press is on open access publishing innovation. So working to create uh, new formats and support scholars who wish to publish new formats, as well as books. 
No journals are being published as yet through Level Press. And a very strong focus also on kind of reinventing processes and looking again at um, practices of publishing. So uh, a completely new contract uh, for open access books, um, uh, different standards for peer review, uh, an approach to peer review that's very thoughtful and transparent, and also use of a new open access, of a new publishing platform, uh, Fulcrum, which has been uh, built at Michigan Publishing. And the first titles will be coming out in, in 2018. So um, Terry asked us to talk about title selection process. And again, these are two rather different initiatives, but I think the difference is best encapsulated as uh, in terms of when the decision to make a work open access is taken. Uh, with Knowledge Unlatched, that decision is usually taken after the book is under contract. Uh, with Lever Press, the idea that this will be open access is considered from the very um, beginning of the process. Um, so Knowledge Unlatched uh, uh, is a compilation of books that have already been selected by their participating publishers. Um, those books have been accepted using the various different selection processes that publishers use, um, almost always, I think, always involving a form of peer review, mostly involving a form of editorial board selection. Um, and those publishing agreements are written usually due to the timing issues with uh, when knowledge unlatched funding gets gathered together. They're usually written before the publisher um, is uh, anticipating an open access edition. So the publisher will write the contract with the idea that this is probably going to be a closed access edition and later Knowledge Unlatched will open it up. It's a very selective program. Um, only 30 to 50% of all titles submitted by the publishers are selected by the Title Selection Committee, which is made up of 40 librarians. Lever Press um, is uh, a publishing program in its own right and the um, direction of the program has been shaped by an oversight committee um, composed of uh, library directors, uh, provosts, uh, others from the participating institutions, and by a faculty editorial board as well. Um, the editors of the initiative recruit content as at another publisher, and um, the form of peer review uh, is dictated, um, uh, is chosen depending on the form of the work. Uh, with guidance from the editorial board. Um, publishing agreements are written with an understanding from the start that this will be an open access work. And publishing agreements um, uh, do not require any payment from the author. And that's a very distinctive and crucial part of the Lever Press initiative, that no uh, contribution is ever required from the author or their institution. The acceptance rate is really not available yet. Um, because uh, the first publications aren't out, um, but uh, it will probably be fairly high. And the reason is that there's already a lot of selection that's gone in, in terms of recruiting content for the platform and for the publishing program. The funding models are, um, are fairly uh, different as well. Um, both involve library contributions. Knowledge Unlatched is now a for-profit limited liability company, uh, uh, the GmbH. Um, uh, classification in Germany. And for a successful unlatching of a collection such as the KU Select 2017, which has a, another 30 days or so to run, it really needs around 300 libraries. Um, it changes a bit because of consortia, but around 300 libraries pledging to purchase a packet of books. And KU Select 2017 has 343 titles, uh, composed of some front lists and some back lists. And, uh, the um, contributions from libraries fund title fees set by the publishers. KU makes its money by taking a percentage of title fee income. So publishers do set their own title fees, um, but they do tend to agglomerate around certain figures. So just as an example, University of Michigan Press has several titles uh, in the KU Select 2017, and our title fees are just over $11,000 for a front list title, and around $2,500 for a backlist title. So that's how, that's how Knowledge Unlatched is, is funded. Lever Press is um, a nonprofit partnership. It's um, the foundational document is a memorandum of understanding between uh, the Oberlin Group, 
um, Amherst and Michigan. Um, it's not its own 501c3 or any such entity. It's um, the contracts actually uh, come from Michigan. Um, around 50 US-based liberal arts colleges uh, libraries are making a contribution of between two and eight thousand dollars per year at a four tiers two four six eight thousand uh, based on uh, their acquisitions budget and those contribution contributions fund the publishing operations um, each title will cost on average around seventeen thousand dollars to produce but um, we expect quite a lot of variation because some of these are digitally and innovative projects some of them are short form um, books and of course the costs vary quite a lot between those two extremes so sort of finally um, sort of looking to the future um, and especially thinking about um, the value of two programs which don't require any payment from the author and I think this is the really distinctive unifying feature of knowledge unlatched and lever press and an important feature I think what we'll see and what we're seeing is a continued negotiation and confusion about um, how much uh, is a reasonable amount um, to, for a publisher to expect uh, for uh, one of these open access works. And quite a lot of confusion between price versus cost. So a lot of studies that have really elucidated how much it costs to produce an, a book, um, but uh, uh, some misunderstanding about whether that is also the price that a publisher would charge for being willing to unlatch uh, the book. And that is, those are two very different things. And so there's quite a lot of arguments about what features of a book should and should not be funded. And I think we'll see that uh, continuing. And as um, Wendy mentioned, you know, a growing concern uh, among authors about um, OA as second tier books, you know, as, as, price, as pricing uh, is sort of sort, sorted out, um, some of the conversations about cost are talking about a, a sort of, you know, a streamlined version of a book uh, that will be open access and um, a, a higher investment in a book that might be closed access. There are a number of things swirling around in that area. Um, increasing interest in how open access can facilitate digital scholarship and examples of how the two are intertwined. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, an example of digital scholarship doesn't have to be open access, and we see very innovative programs uh, and projects and publications from places like Alexander Street Press, which don't necessarily have to be open access. But there is something about uh, not having barriers to machines or to people uh, for reuse, et cetera, in open access that really uh, gets at um, making something truly part of the networked environment. So there's a very close link between digital scholarship and open access. More focus on how open access content is discovered um, uh, in an information supply chain that for books has very important commercial players um, who rely on a portion of the um, list price of a book to actually make themselves whole to sustain their operations. So, you know, there are issues around the information supply chain and discovering open access content. Um, more clarity over what metrics and indicators are relevant for understanding whether open access was the right strategy. So how do we think about um, our goals with open access and have appropriate measures for thinking, uh, for understanding whether we've achieved those goals? For example, reaching audiences outside the academy, reaching um, readers in the developing world, et cetera. Are our measures actually aligned with those goals? And finally, and I think this comes back to the unique characteristic of Lever Press and Knowledge Unlatched, this concern around equity issues within open access, especially when there is a requirement for either the author or their institution or other agent to pay for a book processing charge. And I think this, uh, Wendy referred to this around the, um, the initiative she talked about, you know, what about adjuncts? Are they going to be eligible for uh, an institutional payment through that initiative? What about independent scholars outside the institution? And what about those at less well-resourced institutions? So Lever Press and Knowledge Unlatched get away from those problems, uh, but they're big problems that we have to wrestle with in the environment. So I think that's all I have. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, we're starting to see some interesting questions come in, so I'm sure we're going to have 
a, a great discussion at the end of the presentations. I'll just remind folks, please do send your questions, but recognize that we're going to hold them until all four of our panelists have had a chance to speak. Which brings me to our next panelist, who is Eric Van Rijn, who is currently the interim director at the University of, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I heard something and I apologize for the interruption. Eric is currently interim director at the University of California Press. Previously, he has held positions in marketing, sales, operations, and information technology. His career in the publishing industry has spanned nearly 25 years in both general and academic publishing, including stints at Oxford University Press and HarperCollins Publishers. Eric has participated extensively in industry working groups and committees through industry associations such as the Association of University Presses, the Book Industry Study Group, and CrossRap. He is currently serving as co-principal investigator on the development of Editoria, a Mellon-funded initiative to develop a web-based, digital-first monograph production system to better support open access monograph publishing. But that's not what he's talking about today. Today, Eric will be talking to us about Luminos, the University of California initiative. So Eric, over to you. Thanks very much for that introduction. I hope everybody can see and, uh, and hear me. Um, as Kevin mentioned, I'm here to give you a little bit of an overview today of Luminos, which is uh, the University of California's uh, gold open access monograph publishing program. Um, and I'm gonna start uh, my presentation by uh, just talking a little bit about what the goals were for Luminos when we got the program started a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Luminos was really born out of this idea that the current monograph publishing system doesn't really optimally serve any actor in that system, uh, whether they be authors or presses uh, or, or libraries for that matter. Um, so what we really wanted to do in, in starting up the Luminos publishing program was A, kind of come up with a, a more sustainable business model for how monographs are produced, and B, also increase the access to that scholarship and the impact of that scholarship once it's published. So these were a couple of the overarching goals that we kind of set ourselves for Luminos when we started up the program uh, a couple of years ago. So just a little bit of background on the program. Um, as I mentioned, we started it two years ago. Luminos officially turned to uh, in October of uh, 2017, which is this month. Uh, we have published 40 titles in the program since we started the program two years ago, which is a pretty impressive number actually. Um, in the beginning, a number of those titles were titles that were converted from legacy contracts that came in through our uh, sort of paid program, the, the normal University of California Press publishing program. Um, but now we experience a number of titles that we publish in the Luminos program that are coming in through the front door, if you will. Um, in other words, authors come to us wanting to publish through the Luminos program rather than having a traditional publishing contract uh, with the University of California Press. Um, so we're adding about 25 to 30 new titles annually, um, and I'd like to ramp that up pretty significantly in the next couple of years. I think it's a goal for us to increase our output in the Luminos program. All of the titles that are published right now in the Luminos program are freely downloadable as eBooks, and we make those available in the EPUB, Mobi, and PDF formats. Um, Charles spoke earlier about the challenges of the information supply chain and how ebooks fit into it. And this has indeed been something that we've experienced with Luminos. And I'll talk about it a little bit later, but um, you know, making these available in containerized standard, standards based formats has really been the key to having these books travel through that free information supply chain. Uh, but we also make print copies available for purchase. So generally prices for those titles start around $34.95, but they go up with the cost and complexity of producing those print books. And those are available throughout the information supply chain, if you will. Um, they're available through Amazon, they're available through our own website, and they're available through any number of retailers and wholesalers who make print books available. So just to talk a little bit about the editorial review process for Luminos titles, I think if there's one thing that I 
can't stress enough, it's that the editorial review process for Luminos titles is really no different than it is for other UC Press titles. Uh, there isn't a separate Luminos path for peer review. Um, it's basically a two-step process at the University of California Press. Uh, there's a curation and selection process that happens in the commissioning process where our acquisitions editors are involved. That's uh, a step of it. And during that process, uh, but all of our manuscripts are reviewed by at least two qualified outside peer reviewers who are usually working in the author's same field or discipline. So that's the initial kind of peer review that uh, Luminos titles go through. Then there's a second stage of peer review that is uh, unique to the University of California Press, although not unique among university presses, which is that our faculty editorial committee has to approve any publications that are published by the University of California Press. They publish, they control our imprint. Um, so. Uh, the full manuscript is read by a member of our editorial committee. We have a 20-member editorial committee, uh, two members from each of our 10 campuses, and they make a recommendation to publish, and if it's agreed to by the entire board, then the title is published. So it's a two-step peer review process at the University of California Press, and again, it's no different for Luminos than it is for any other title. So um, some of you may have seen this infographic before. Um, but I'll review it um, to talk about the business model for Luminos. Uh, Luminos has a, a kind of a complicated business model in which the costs of publishing an open access monograph are shared amongst the various actors in the system. So we assume a kind of baseline title publication cost of about $15,000, which goes up with complexity uh, of the manuscript. And there are really four sources of income that we use to kind of underwrite the publication fees associated with making free global digital access available. So the first component is the author's or the author's institution's contribution to the publication costs. And that's assumed to be $7,500 in the baseline case, which is a, uh, you know, uh, a 90,000 word manuscript and less than 25 uh, figures in the manuscript. Uh, then there's a library subsidy that is generated from a library membership fund that we, uh, that we have uh, contributions to from about 25 libraries at this point. Then there's a, a straight UC Press subsidy, which we use to contribute to underwriting these costs, which is $2,500. And then we also programmatically figure in the revenue from print sales of these titles as another stream of income that helps support open access monograph publishing at, at UC Press. So just to talk a little bit about the future for Luminos, um, I would say that I expect a continued commitment to growth of the program. Um, we're really uh, committed to, to growing the, the size and number of titles that are coming out in the Luminos program, uh, also expanding the, the focus of the program to focus on some key disciplines where uh, we can really provide some, some help uh, through open access publishing. We also are very interested in expanding the library membership program. Um, this is an area where we'd like to get as many people involved as possible because it helps us do more open access publishing. And as Charles alluded to earlier in his presentation, we have partnered with Knowledge Unlatched who have begun to offer their library outreach services as a service to publishers who are looking to uh, support their, their membership programs and other ways of underwriting their costs of publishing OA monographs. Um, and Knowledge Unlatched is one way that libraries can have a kind of one-stop shopping, if you will, for a number of participating programs who are trying to raise funds for their open access publishing initiatives. So we're delighted to partner with them and we're excited about that partnership. But by all means, people can also uh, get directly in touch with us in order to become uh, members of the program and support the program. Um, also to sort of uh, talk a little bit about how information travels through the free information supply chain. Again, something that Charles alluded to. Um, we're really trying to emphasize the use of standards-based formats in the program uh, in order to support any digital enhancements that people want to add into their 
into their ebooks that they publish through the program. We do publish titles in both print and ebook format, but if you have uh, a case where somebody wants to embed, for instance, audio or video or something like that, we're really trying to rely on the EPUB standard in order to support that. And I think increasingly you're probably going to see uh, a lot more of this as monographs begin to go digital uh, through open access publishing programs. And that's the Luminous program in a nutshell. Thank you very much, Eric. Sorry, I was muted for a moment there. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. We're getting really interesting questions coming in. Uh, our final speaker this afternoon is Laura Mainville. Laura is the director of the University of Ottawa Press the only fully bilingual university press in North America, as well as the oldest of the Canadian Francophone presses. Laura was elected Vice President of the Association of Canadian University Presses, the ACUP, in November of 2016, after a term as Secretary Treasurer. She is the ACUP's delegate to the Canadian Scholarly Publishing Working Group. She is also a member of the Association of American University Presses, the AAUP, the a Small Presses Committee on the AAUP. Sorry, it's hard to read that as a, and of the International Convention of University Presses Organizing Committee. You're on some very long titled groups, Laura. Indeed. Um, <laughs> she's also a member of the University of Ottawa and Library and Archives Canada Program Committee. Laura will be speaking about the OA monographs that are funded by the University of Ottawa Library. So Laura, please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here today and especially happy that I don't need to translate all of those very long titles because we would be here all day. So the <laughs> University of Ottawa Press has been uh, publishing uh, open access uh, monographs uh, for the past eight years now. And um, <clears throat> this has allowed us to gather a lot of data. So I would like to thank my colleagues who helped me put pull all of this together. A uh, few quick words. Uh, this is pretty much what I can see from my window, Parliament Hill and the Chateau Laurier and the Rideau Canal, which everyone has seen. But uh, basically what I wanted to tell you is that the University of Ottawa is the world's largest English-French bilingual university, so we work in a very bilingual environment. And our open access is a fully um, bilingual program. Um, <clears throat> we have 42,000 students and 70% of these students are Anglophones. Um, in terms of the University of Ottawa Press, our press was founded in 1936. We publish uh, this year, we're publishing 30 titles and next year we are also planning on publishing 30 titles. Right now we have over 500 active University of Ottawa Press titles. And of those, our open access titles um, amount to 80 uh, titles in, in our open access collection. And so that means, for anyone who's good in math, it means approximately 15% of our, of our active list. So, <clears throat> um, a quick overview of where we are. We're right over here. And um, I also included stars for the other uh, open access um, programs at, a, at other presses in Canada, including Athabasca Press. I know they're here today and um, a couple of other university uh, presses. So UBC has been uh, published, has started publishing a few titles, uh, University of Calgary, University of Ottawa, um, University of Montreal, and there are others as well. Oops. Moving on. So we currently, as I said, have 70, uh, almost 80 titles now. And <clears throat> the reason that we have so many is that our program started in 2009 following uh, University of Ottawa um, announcement that the university was uh, adopting an open, an open access program. So this was in 2000, December 2009. Uh, the program was designed to adopt a comprehensive access program that supports free and unrestricted access to scholarly research and included uh, the hiring of, of a scholarly communications librarian, uh, a, an institutional repository, uh, 
supporting OA journals, as well as an open access uh, monograph pilot project through our press. So um, initially what the press did, and this is before I arrived at the press, uh, the press and the library worked together to uh, unlatch um, several titles in 2010 and 11. And then in 2012, uh, the library and the press signed a um, memorandum of understanding to um, <clears throat> to publish uh, to three uh, open access monographs or edited volumes with uh, funding of a maximum of $10,000 Canadian uh, per uh, book to a maximum of $30,000 per financial year. Uh, the open access funding was not meant to replace a uh, title subsidy, but rather to uh, support open access per se. The, um, the open access um, pilot project also uh, included a new open access series at the press of the law technology and media series, which is directed or edited by Michael Geist, who is a strong proponent of open access. Oops. Uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of what our press looks like and what our university uh, repository looks like. So you can see here, if you do a quick search, we currently have 74 titles on our on the repository. And when we get to the end of our uh, fiscal year at the end of April, so right over here, we will have 77 titles altogether. Now, I what I did is a quick breakdown just to kind of get a the lay of the land. We currently have, <clears throat> well, at the end of our year, we'll have 19 frontless titles published through this memorandum of understanding, and we have 58 backlist titles. Um, at the end of next year, uh, we will have 81 titles, so 15% of our catalog. Moving on. Um, so <clears throat> I wanted to give you a sense of how we go about uh, selecting uh, titles for uh, publishing in the open access stream. So obviously we start with author approval. We approach the authors uh, when we see that there's potential. Uh, if the author refuses, of course, we, don't, uh, we do not go forward with open access. If they do, well, of course, then we need to um, try and strike a balance between the type of book, whether it's monograph, edited volume, the type of content, um, and whether it's tied to current affairs or whether it's an obscure academic subject, um, the series, the author, uh, whether the author is well known or from general public. We do have uh, some very well known um, authors such as Michael Geist, who's, and the, the, the data actually reflects that. Uh, we try and strike a balance in terms of language. And of course, sometimes we have specific other specific reasons. So what you see at the bottom here is that we have a breakdown of about uh, 30, 60% or 31% and 69% for, um, for the, in terms of the language breakdown. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our editorial review process and the funding of our program, uh, there is no difference in terms of peer review um, between our open access titles and our non-open access titles. All books published here are peer reviewed, uh, single blind and as we all do. Um, <clears throat> and they also require editorial board approval. Um, all books require a title subsidy for us to ensure uh, financial sustainability of our books, whether they are open access or not. <clears throat> I just uh, copied and pasted a, a sample uh, clauses from our publishing contract. So we use the uh, Creative Commons BYNCSA 4.0 license and um, the copyright remains with the author. Now, 
<clears throat> in terms of the findings, I will go through very, very quickly. Um, so quickly that uh, I just did a quick um, uh, capture of the écran, a screen capture, uh, and we can't even see what the, what the content is. But I wanted to give you an idea of the type of uh, data that we've been able to collect. So um, looking at sales, the print, uh, print sales, ebook sales of our open access titles uh, in terms of units and in terms of, uh, in terms of, ca of uh, uh, net sales. We then compared that to the page views and the downloads from our university repository. And we also uh, take a look at the language statistics and other types of stats. So quick run through <clears throat> because I want to reserve time for questions. Um, what this is, allows us to do is to uh, take a look at which titles are performing most and what we see is that the ones uh, that are cl most closely tied to current events are the ones that, that, are, that sell uh, the most and that are downloaded and uh, viewed the most. And that's not at all surprising, of course. <clears throat> uh, this, this is just another uh, way of taking a look at what the data says. In other words, when you look at the, um, uh, in the top corner is the 2006, uh, 2016 data, and the 2017 data um, shows that the, the downloads are much higher than the ebook sales and print sales, but that there seems to be a correlation. So the question, therefore, is does open access um, help sales or hinder sales? <clears throat> if we look at it from another angle, it's still uh, just in terms of the ebook sales versus downloads. It's pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> and in terms of page views, not much has changed. We still have pretty much the same type of pattern of usage. Same thing here, except that there are a couple of anomalies, and I just wanted to flag one. So this book here, Esthétique et Recyclage Culturel, it's a French book. For some reason, it was, it's shot right up in terms of downloads in 2017. I'm going to look into it to try and figure out why, where, and because it's not a new book, um, nor is it anything that's related to current events. But um, I'm very curious about that, and I will definitely follow up on that. Now, this is the, the, interesting, um, the interesting findings here. So what we see is a comparison between the 2016 and the 2017 results. So in terms of unit sales under the first column here, what we see is an increase in terms of the number of units, 67%, as well as an increase in terms of the actual sales, so in dollar figures. But the increase in units isn't, in, in revenue doesn't match the increase in units. So that's a little bit worrisome for me. And here I'm only looking at, the, at our open access collection for this entire table. In terms of the open consultations, what we see is like a twofold increase in terms of page views as well as downloads. So I think that's great in terms of knowledge dissemination. However, there is a 19% drop in print versus ebook units. And here at our press, I'm assuming it's the same for everyone, print books generate more uh, a larger profit margin. So this drop to me is a little bit worrisome. Now, <clears throat> finally, there is a 30% drop in terms of print, whoops, print versus, uh, sorry, I can't see. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of prints, uh, sales in, and uh, total open consultations. So, this is perhaps um, only a one-year blip. It could also be a worrisome trend. I'm not sure yet. Next year, I'll have more information. But I figured I would share it with you today. 
Now, in terms of the perspectives on open access, um, I have been thinking a lot about this as well as uh, everyone here today. Gaps, future research questions. So who exactly is using our books and why? And how do we capture the full extent of open access dissemination online? Lost sales, how do we measure them? How will open access affect revenues in the long term? Um, I'm particularly concerned about right sales and permissions revenues. Um, the language divide, um, how does that split up? And what about sustainability of open access funding? Finally, the systemic changes that might be required to ensure sustainable open access in Canada. We will be furthering our experiment with open access because it's still considered an experiment here, a pilot project um, <clears throat> through our open access collection, through our partnerships with Open Edition and OAPEN and Knowledge Unlatched and our new Perspectives on Open Access series. Um, we'll also be tracking our results. I will leave you with this, the, this quote from one of my colleagues who published an article on uh, um, the library and press uh, in partnership. It's very much experimentation and innovation uh, to align with issues of fiscal sustainability and the impact of val and value of scholarly publishing. Open access in its various incarnations is a disruptive business. I will leave you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have just a few minutes left for questions and an overwhelming number of them. So I'm going to try and ask one question at least of each of our panelists. We'll see if we have time. So panelists, please, very brief answers, but I'm gonna ask you challenging questions. So I understand that that's, that's difficult. Wendy, can I start with you? Um, we had a question come in the, about the model that you were explaining that pointed out that 11 of the 12 institutions that are part of your partnership at this point also have presses of their own. And so the question was, are we actually furthering the inequality in access to publishing by having universities that already support a press also support this AARL AAUP project. Um, so over to you. Well, I think one of the things that was uh, mentioned in that, that question when I saw it come in online is why not fund the press directly at the institute? Right. And I think that we're not really talking about, uh, we're not disrupt disrupting the traditional model where an author seeks out a press, uh, but rather having institutions uh, enable that author to find the right match of press and giving them the wherewithal to get a digital and open version. So the author still is total freedom to target whatever press and the presses accept manuscripts based on their normal standards and, and peer review process. So it, it, I don't know, another way to say it other than that we're not trying to disrupt that normal um, independence of, of author. Uh, it is the case that any one of the university presses could accept these subventions, and, and I don't know why they wouldn't accept them, even though right mm -hmm. now only 70 presses have agreed to be part of um, the initiative. Okay, thank you. Um, that actually points nicely to the question I'd like to ask you, Eric. And talking, Wendy was talking about authors and their, their free ability to make choices of where they want to publish. The one question that came in for you was, how do you relate to authors? How do you convince them that this is a good idea, this model of publishing, which costs them some money, is a good idea? What kind of reluctance do you run into, and what tips the balance in favor of open access? Uh, so I would say in the beginning of the program, uh, there was a lot of, you know, sort of salesmanship that had to go into it. Um, and actually, we helped underwrite the costs of some of those early books that we put through the program. But it's interesting now we have a lot of authors who actually approach us about publishing through the Luminos program. So when they start that initial uh, conversation with their acquisitions editor, they're talking about publishing open access. And we found that 
uh, access to funding to help support the publication of these books has not been a huge impediment to publishing through the Luminos program so far. Now, given the, this, the small number of titles that we published, you know, th this could be masking a much larger sort of uh, program or a problem in the, you know, uh, in the publishing community. But our experience has not been that, that we've had a lot of trouble getting people to publish in, in Luminos. Great, thank you. Um, Charles, I'd actually like to ask you two questions. One I hope is very quick that you probably saw come in, and that's that somebody asked whether Lever Press is limited to liberal arts institution libraries or can other people participate? So uh, it's um, the funders are currently liberal arts college institutions, although um, Santa Clara, uh, and this has come up on chat, it is aligned with the mission and ethos of liberal arts colleges, maybe uh, not necessarily liberal arts college itself, but it is limited to liberal arts colleges, partly because the publishing program is focused on that mission and ethos. Okay, thank you. The other question I was hoping you'd field uh, is the one that came in about discoverability. How do people find these, uh, these monographs that you're publishing? Uh, in any of the projects, and this would be a reasonable question for anybody to answer if they'd like to, how do they find them? And do you actually have statistics about how people are getting to these monographs? On October 30th, um, Knowledge Unlashed Research will release a study that uh, um, Cornell, California, um, uh, UCL Press, and Michigan have collaborated with JSTOR on, looking at discoverability of open access work through JSTOR. Um, uh, so you'll see that on the KUResearch.org site um, coming soon. Uh, what we found there is uh, JSTOR is by far the best discovery um, mechanism for open access books. Uh, but people are also coming at them through Google, through um, search engines. But one of the places they're not coming to them from is from library catalogs because um, mm. It is very difficult um, to, uh, for, for, for libraries to um, index these books because of their reliance on jobbers and vendors who don't necessarily reveal the existence of an open access version. Thank you. Uh, probably it's the last question that I'll ask you, Laura. Um, and that's the, the one I'd really like you to, well, I have two questions. I don't know which one to ask you. The one I'd really like you to address, because I think it's very important, is the question that was raised about accessibility, uh, about the accessibility of online monographs for people with disabilities. Do you ha take any steps? Do you work with experts to increase the accessibility of the monographs that you publish? It's an excellent question. We don't currently do that. Uh, when we do have um, requests for um, to make a, um, one of our books accessible, uh, we do um, make it available, but we're not currently um, equipped to do that in a, in a sustainable way for all of our titles. Thank you. Um, if I can squeeze in one more question, I will do that, and it's directed primarily to you, Eric. Um, do you see, what do you see as the future here? Do you see a future where the University of California Press moves entirely to open access monographs? This would be a good question for Lara, too, since you both publish um, a mix of titles. So what's the future look like? Anybody, help. <laughs> I think it's complicated. Um, you know, there's a continuum that these titles exist on. Um, you know, a number of our titles that are published, uh, you know, become commercial successes one way or another. And so as long as, you know, uh, cost recovery is, a, you know, part of the University of California press ecosystem, I think we have to look at a mix of, you know, both commercial and open access titles that we're publishing here. Uh, and uh, some monographs actually go on to be, you know, big commercial successes also. So I think we have to think in a kind of balanced way and holistically about, you know, the, the portfolio of a university press and what that looks like going forward. There may be some uh, fairly specialized titles that go 100% in the open access direction, but I, I don't expect that it will be uh, an exclusive thing uh, at any time in the, in the near future. That's just my own take. Laura, do you want to say anything about that? 
We are going to be monitoring the data, um, the usage data, but I don't expect us to go to flip to open access 100% uh, in the near future. If so, we would need um, a lot of uh, additional support to make sure that uh, the press remains financially viable and um, a long-term commitment because once the books are open, um, we can't unopen them. We can't close the door, if you will. And, um, and it's going, we're still trying to figure out what the impact of open access will be in the long term. Um, but I don't see it, I, I just can't imagine going full open access at this point. Well, we've reached, thank you, Laura. We've reached uh, one minute past the top of the hour. So I think that all that remains is to thank all of you for your participation and to thank the people who have tuned in and who have sent their questions for a very stimulating conversation. Thank you all.